viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The ties between India and the US are gaining strength and momentum with two sides increasingly engaging with each other at different platforms. Both New Delhi and Washington, who are part of the Quad Alliance, have not let the grouping commitments weigh down their bilateral ties. The recent reciprocal visit by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to New Delhi has made it even more prominent that both are committed to widening the interests of engagements and deepening their ties. An upswing in the trajectory of Indo-U.S. bilateral ties is changing the dynamics of both South Asian and Indo-Pacific geopolitics. With key focus on integrated fight against the COVID, creation of a smooth, multiplayer supply chain and boosting of trade relations between the two sides, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Indian Foreign Minister S. J. Shankar held wide-ranging talks over a host of bilateral and global issues. While both sides plan to further strengthen their trade ties that have picked momentum in the past decade, Washington has also been striving to ramp up its arms sales in India, which has so far been neutral in choosing its manufacturing units. The two sides have also come closer on the backdrop of growing aggression of China in the Indo-Pacific, deteriorating situation in Afghanistan and increasing proximity between Islamabad and Beijing that has been feared as potentially destabilizing by experts. There is a greater imperative than ever, I think, on cooperation, coordination, collaboration uh, among countries, especially uh, among countries who uh, share basic perspectives, uh, basic values, uh, and basic interests. And that is certainly the case with the United States and India. While the grouping of US and India along with Japan and Australia has emerged as a challenge to China's imperialistic designs, both New Delhi and Washington have maintained that their objective is to ensure a free and safe Indo-Pacific and nothing more. And while China has ridiculed the Quad saying it was a headline-grabbing idea that would dissipate like the sea foam in the Pacific or Indian Ocean, it has now acknowledged its assertive nature with its stance urging countries to reframe from forming close and exclusive cliques. India, on the other side, maintains that its only agenda is to secure its own borders and see a stabilized and peaceful region. Peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific is as important for both of us as democratic stability in Afghanistan. Deepening the Quad as a collaborative platform is in our mutual interest, and we must work together even more closely on key contemporary challenges like terrorism, climate change, pandemics, and resilient supply chains. Blinken also held talks with representatives of Tibetan government in exile. Lately, the U.S. has acknowledged and backed the Tibetan demand for freedom from the clutches of China. A few weeks back, the U.S. Congress passed the Tibet Policy and Support Act, which calls for the rights of Tibetans to choose the successor to the Dalai Lama and the establishment of a U.S. consulate in the Tibetan capital, Lhasa. Much to the frustration of China, the U.S. stance has been strengthened by Beijing's consistently declining human rights record. Tibetans believe that India and the U.S. can jointly oppose China. So, you know, these countries, they should come together, come together and they, they brainstorm how to stop this, the disease disease and the communist Chinese spreading all over the world. Experts say it is incumbent upon the US and India for being two of the biggest democracies of the world to play a key role in setting the global order. 
with an in-person quad meet scheduled this October in the United States, the political observers are hoping for a clear-cut policy on China too. In the meantime, both Washington and New Delhi have a massive task of immunizing their citizens who have been affected most across the world by the virus that originated and spread from China. Moving on. Massive protests erupted in Pakistan occupied Kashmir after Pakistan's ruling party, PTI, emerged victorious in the assembly elections that were marred with violence and the allegations of pre-poll rigging. The locals have rejected the results, saying the army, through its massive troops deployment, manipulated the entire democratic exercise and conducted a poll where the results were predetermined. While crying out Pakistan's illegal occupation of the region and the use of indiscriminate force to suppress the citizens, they demanded their fundamental rights and freedom from Pakistani clutches. Burning tires, sloganering mob, fist fights and skirmishes. The illegally occupied region of POK has been on the boil for the past one week. Reason, Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan and his party Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf or PTI, which Kashmiri people accuse of pre poll rigging and electorate manipulation. <laughs> Khan's party has secured a decisive victory by winning 25 of the contested 45 seats, but locals have rejected the results as fraud. The region went to polls on 25th July and disturbing scenes started surfacing as soon as the voting commenced. The locals and the booth agents from different parties said that PTI workers rampaged through polling stations. They threatened them, assaulted them and threw them out of the polling premises when they resisted. इनके कोई 20 25 इन्होंने अपने बंदे रखे हुए हैं जो सलूदकार हैं वो लोगों से वोट खुद ले रहे हैं और उस पर स्टेम खुद मार रहे हैं स्टेम खुद लगा रहे हैं पर्दे का कोई इंतजाम नहीं है दो पुलिस वाले हैं और मनमानी है अगर इस तरह के जाली इलेक्शंस करवा रहे हैं इसका कोई फायदा नहीं है इस रियासत को तो क्या तो कहते हैं कि आप पोलिंग एजेंट के तौर पर बाइकॉट करते हैं क्या करते हैं पोलिंग तो पोलिंग एजेंट के तौर पर इस जाली इस निजाम से इस दानली वाले निजाम से इस फजूदा निजाम से इस जो जाली और क्रैप्ट किस्म के लोग जो लेके आ रहे हैं उनसे मैं मुकम्मल बाइकॉट का ऐलान करता हूं इस पर मैं लानत भेजता हूं ऐसे ऑफिसरों पर और ऐसे निजाम पर the Islamabad version describes this region as an autonomous territory with all political and administrative decision-making in the hands of people chosen by the locals. The reality, however, reeks of decades of iron fist control by Islamabad with human rights situation recording a continuous decline. Ever since the region has held elections, they have either been won by the party enjoying the blessings of Islamabad or by the ruling party itself. Shabir Chaudhry, an exiled Kashmiri activist living in London says, Pakistan cannot be trusted for even little welfare of Kashmiris. According to him, the elections in the region are held to mislead the international community. He accuses Pakistan of cheating even during its rigging drive. This election is also fake. This leadership is also fake. This narabazi is also fake. And after all this, the only thing that the system is that the people who have been given to 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 the people तो वो नोट असली नहीं थे हर जगह जालसाजी हर जगह धोखा हर जगह फ्रॉड कश्मीरी जम्मू कश्मीर के लोगों के साथ ये पहली बार नहीं
Islamabad has ensured over the years that no Kashmiri leader rises to prominence and popularity at par with Pakistani leaders. Region-based parties with a vision to change the discourse are nipped in the bud. They install a stooge who simply obeys instructions that are passed from either of Islamabad or the general headquarters, Rawalpindi. With media restrictions in place and voices of people daring to speak against the establishment getting muzzled through state machinery, the prevailing system in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir has not witnessed any real challenge thus far. But with people determined to take it to another level this time for their own and their families' rights, there could be a little light emerging at the end of the tunnel. Moving on. As Taliban rampages through the country and neighboring states shut their borders to prevent the influx of refugees, the Afghan refugees are stuck in the middle of a rock and a hard thing. Most of them, whose areas are now controlled almost entirely by the Taliban, are forced to flee their homes but have no idea where they should be heading. Experts warn of a looming humanitarian crisis if the alarms are not paid heed to and an immediate solution is not worked out. Turkey has taken a moral high ground and has been urging the US and other world leaders to stand up for Afghanistan, but is denying them access to their territory. Ankara is constructing a modular wall along 295 kilometers border with Iran, where it believes Afghan migrants can enter from. 64 kilometer long section of the wall will be completed by the end of this year. Foreign ministers from Turkey, Afghanistan and Iran had earlier discussed cooperation on security, energy and migration, but no specific mechanism has yet been finalized. And this has barricaded entry of scores who have already left their homes and cannot return for they fear they will be the first target of Taliban now. Taliban, which is on a territory capturing spree, has urged youths of the country to pick arms against the Kabul establishment, which has ramped up its operations against the insurgents. And with over 95% U.S. troops gone, the Taliban have sniffed an opportunity of ruling the country once again. Experts have speculated that the Taliban will capture the entire country in six months of U.S. departure. The pace of their current progress can make it happen even before that. <laughs> A growing Taliban offensive has also prompted an overwhelming intrastate migration of people within Afghanistan. The UN Refugee Agency estimates 270,000 Afghans have been displaced inside the country since January, bringing the number of people forced from their homes to more than 3.5 million. And while the US promises to support them even when their troops are gone, Beijing has seen it as an opportunity to expand its presence and influence in the country. Its top diplomats and ministers have been seen meeting the Taliban. 
Experts say any state support to the Taliban could lead it to become a pariah state with even worse consequences for the world. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that made news this week. Bangkok plans to create 240 beds for coronavirus patients with mild symptoms by turning train carriages into an isolation center. It comes as daily reported cases in the capital continue to generally trend upwards, according to government data, placing a strain on medical facilities. Governor Aswin Kwan Wang said in a statement, 15 cars will initially be converted to take in patients while they wait for space in hospitals. Heavy monsoon rains triggered flooding in refugee camps in southern Bangladesh. Video posted on social media showed summer's areas of Bangladesh's Cox's Bazar and residents wading through the flood waters. Nearly 1 million Rohingya live in crowded camps in border district of Cox's Bazar, the world's largest refugee settlement after fleeing a military crackdown in neighboring Myanmar in 2017. The Bangladesh Weather Office said it expected heavy rains to continue for next few days. Rohingya refugees mostly live in shacks made of bamboo and plastic sheets that cling to steep, bare hills and flooding has further worsened their living conditions. The scholarship granting ceremony of a on one percent club foundation was recently held in Chiba Prefecture with a total number of 37 students. The Aon Scholarship is an allowance-based scholarship for university students in various Asian countries and self-financed Asian students studying in Japan. Students can get financial support for two years, grants in university classes fee and lodging expenses. A total of 14 universities are accepting this scholarship. The project was started in the year 2006 with the hope that scholarship recipients will play an active role in connecting their home countries with Japan via excelling in their respective fields. Till now, 951 students from 12 countries have received Aeon scholarship and have studied in Japan. The principle of Aeon is to establish a global circle and develop budding talents that can perform globally. Famous for its lush green cedar forest, Oguni town is located in Kumamoto prefecture in southern Japan. For 250 years, the residents of the area have been running a sustainable project to plant cedar trees and sell its wood as cedar wood timber is widely used to build homes in Japan. There are more than 1 million cedar trees in Oguni. Hello.小国の杉、結構あの全国でも有名になってきてます。で、え、ま、他の地域とちょっと違うところと言いますと、あの、小国町は温泉の出る土地柄なんですけど、そのあの、地下から出る地熱の蒸気、え、これを活用して木材を
Every year, about 38,000 cedar trees are cut in Oguni, but 40,000 seedlings are planted too. This way of preserving trees has become an example of sustainability throughout Japan and the world. In our cultural section of South Asia Focus, we take a look at the auspicious month of Shravan. Shravan is a holy month where devotees seek the blessing of Lord Shiva. It is performed by both married and unmarried women for the well-being of their family members. Devotees in various Indian temple towns took holy dips and thronged Shiva temples to offer prayers on the first Monday of Shravan. A large number of Hindu devotees visited the temples of Lord Shiva across India to mark the first Monday of the month-long auspicious Shravan or monsoon festival. Shravan is a holy month which is dedicated to Lord Shiva. On the occasion, devotees in Hindu pilgrimage cities of Prayagraj and Varanasi took holy dips in Ganges River and offered prayers, milk, water and wood apple leaves or bale patra to Lord Shiva. It is believed that anyone who worships Lord Shiva with whole heart in Shravan month gets all their wishes fulfilled. सावन का महत्व यह है कि पूरा महीना ये बाबा विश्वनाथ और बाबा शिव शंकर के नाम पे जाता है हर दिन यहां पे शुभ माना जाता है और विशेषकर हर जगह पे जहां भी शिवलिंग है उन सभी जगहों पे ये आज के दिन बहुत ज्यादा मान्यता रहती है कि पहला सोमवार है एक बार जरूर दर्शन कर लें बाकी ये पूरे 300 दिन जितने दिन सावन है हमारा हर दिन दर्शन के लिए श्रद्धालु रोज आपको इतने दिखेंगे a Shravan month Monday is considered to be one of the most auspicious days as per Hindu almanac Many disciples observe fast on this day and pray to the shivling every day. While some take single meal during the day, others keep grain and just take fruits. Unmarried women observe fast to receive Shiva's blessing in finding a suitable spouse. सावन का सोमवार का व्रत अपनी ससा कहते हैं कि अच्छे पति के लिए रखते हैं। कोविड लगा हुआ लेकिन फिर भी बहुत भीड़ है। रात से ही काफी भीड़ है यहाँ पर। the month of Shravan is also associated with swings, popularly known as Jula, which has a special place in Indian celebrations. Deities are portrayed sitting on decorated swings during rituals. To celebrate this month-long festival, women buy green bangles and apply hina on their hands. According to legends mentioned in Hindu Vedas and Purans, Shravan has a special relevance to Lord Shiva and his spouse Goddess Parvati and it is believed that worshipping them in this month will help devotees attain salvation or moksha. Various festivals like Nag Panchami, Shravani Purnima, Vara Lakshmi, Vrat, Govatsa, Raksha Bandhan, Rishi Panchami are also celebrated in this auspicious month, making it the most blissful month of the year. Shravan is the fifth holy month and Shravani fair begins on Shravan Amavasya, the no moon day of the month and ends on Shravan Purnima, full moon day of the month. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.